now. Video is starting to play. Okay, welcome all. Welcome to our final 2020 edition of Bacardi Talks. We're changing it up a little bit today. We have an amazing panel coming at you. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the next gen, the next generation of hospitality leaders. So we'll have a few minutes to introduce everybody and see what's going on. Now we are recording and this is live. This also broadcast will be brought to you tomorrow on Two Bar Stools and a Knife, just in case you missed it or you had so much fun the first time, you want to listen to it again. Now, speaking of fun, uh, ready, Michael? That's a, look at that setup right there. Let's throw it over to our favorite dean, Dr. Michael Chang. Dean Chang, sir, how are you? Wonderful. Thank you, Professor Connors. It is a pleasure to be here today with you all. And as Brian said, welcome. I'm very pleased that you're all available to join us here today for our fourth edition and final for the year of Bacardi Talks at the Chaplin School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. And for those of you who are new to the Chaplin School at FIU, here's some fun facts. We are the third largest university and the second largest hospitality program in the country. And the first to open a very successful campus in China for hospitality management with the Tianjin University of Commerce. Our school have graduated over 17,000 alumni worldwide. And right here on this panel today is two of our very successful alumni. We're so proud of them. And our online bachelor's program is ranked number one in the country for the last five consecutive years. We are ranked top 50 in the world. And our students here at FIU and the Chaplin School represent the future of our country and our global industry with 38% Hispanics and Latinos and 35% international students. We're deeply invested in our industry and our community. And during this pandemic, we raised almost $1.6 million to help our industry. Thanks to our partners like Bacardi and Badia Spices that goes to us supporting laid off and fellow restaurant workers in Miami-Dade, Broward and Palm Beach counties in partnership with the Sabish Wine Food Festival. Again, thank you so much. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here today to our fourth edition of Bacardi Talks featuring these three very talented panelists. Thank you, hey, Brian. You got it, doctor. Always a pleasure. Happy holidays to you, Michael. You know, I have a feeling I might see you before that, but I'm, I have it in my notes. That's the only script I use that says, make sure you say happy holidays to people. That's all well and good. So let's uh, take a quick little roll of what we're doing today. As we said, we got a great panel of some industry experts all hand selected for distinctly what they do in our segment. So we're gonna be representing the fine dining segment. We're gonna be representing the culinary and media segment. And of course, we're gonna be representing the beverage side, go figure with the Bacardi talks, but also the wine side. And my good friend Ray also uh, is part of the cruise industry. So we got a lot going on here today. And we got some great stories to tell. Uh, as at the end, if you have time to stick around, uh, and you wanna have some questions or one-on-one -on -one time, we kind of, chucked off a little bit of time there at the end, particularly for students that are graduating or you have a specific student uh, question for any of our panelists, we'll do that at the end. We're also at one point, we're gonna throw this over to our favorite chef, Chef John Noble Massey, uh, because this is gonna be again, uh, posted tomorrow on two bar stools and a knife. So John's gonna pop on with some words of wisdom and I'm sure John is gonna, no pressure, John, uh, a great question along the way. So without further ado, let me do a quick little introductions here and then they're each of them are gonna tell their own story along the way. Uh, so we're joined today by uh, Andrew, i.e. Cappy. So we're gonna be calling him Cappy the whole time who also has a great story. Raffaella, 
Also, Raffaella has an amazing story currently working with Thomas Keller in French Laundry out in Napa Valley. I love how you and I met too, it was great. I walked in, I was wearing my FIU pin. She says, I went to FIU and I have two degrees. And I said, hi, I'm Professor Connors. Uh, and then of course, as I said earlier, uh, my old student and old friend Ray, uh, we'll be talking about his experience, his journey into the world of sommelier, but as well as the cruise industry. I wonder how those two things happen, right? It's interesting. So let's throw it over to, uh, to Cappy first there, as I jokingly said before, our senior statesman uh, for uh, this panel. But you also got a great story, Cappy. And, you know, part of Bacardi Talks is all about listening to some great stories. So let's hear a little bit about your story, Cappy. Thank you, Professor Connors. Thanks for having me. Thank you to FIU, Chaplain School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. Big fan, proud to be an alumni. Love talking about it week in and week out on any chance I get, quite frankly. Hey. Um, proud to see some familiar faces here, too. Some new faces. This is great. Anyway, uh, pleasantries aside, um, I, uh, I'm from Chicago. I'm based here. I grew up in the food industry, kind of. Uh, I went to uh, University of Kansas for a couple years before I realized, um, what am I doing here? Um, I loved it, but I wanted to do something else. Uh, I always loved cooking. Um, I loved food. I started seeing uh, late night infomercials uh, for culinary schools while I was in college at two in the morning, uh, sitting up awake in my bed. So I lived in a house with eight other people. I decided to get some applications in the mail. Soon enough, my roommates were, you know, coming into my room saying, what the heck is this, Kaplan? You're not going anywhere. Um, so one spring break, they were all going off to Vegas. I decided to visit a couple culinary schools on the East Coast. And after two years at a university, I uh, made the switch and I went to Culinary Institute of America. Um, 20 mon 21 month program, fantastic school, loved every minute of it. Um, after, uh, CIA, one of my chef instructors who is a certified master chef, there's, uh, only a handful of them in this country. He said, Kaplan, what's your plan? Um, you're a good student. You get everything done. Your food tastes good, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you, 10 years from now, you could be one of the best chefs in the country, but do you want to be a chef? Um, you know, I also, he said, I also think 10 years from now, the culinary program and the hospitality program is going to be, you're going to need to take them together at this school. So he encouraged me to go on and get a hospitality degree. Um, at the time, there was only very few people who, uh, only very few students allowed in the program at CIA. It was very new, the bachelor's program at the time. Um, so I looked into other top hospitality schools around the country. I walked into the president of the Culinary Institute of America's office to ask him. Uh, my mom always taught me, uh, go to the top. Um, so I went to the top and uh, he rattled off a few schools um, for a couple different reasons. FIU is one of them within there and for a couple of different reasons. Uh, also beyond that, I wound up applying to FIU um, shortly after. Uh, I went from New York back home to Chicago for a few months to, to work. Um, and then I went out to Miami, um, started at FIU in the early 2000s. I was used to going to school year round at CIA. Um, so I just cruised through and took a full load of classes every semester through the summer and everything had some transfer credits being that I was in schools before that, um, and had an incredible experience um, at FIU. Um, I actually moved to Miami one week after the first South Beach Wine and Food Festival on the beach. I remember going there and seeing all the banner flagpoles saying South Beach Wine and Food Festival. Ah, dang it, it was last weekend. Um, that was the first one. So um, I wound up being a student volunteer uh, for the year two. Uh, worked closely with Chef uh, Michael Moran, who was a chef instructor there at the time, and many other chefs, and um, was a student lead for the culinary demonstrations. And um, I could go on and on, but I'll just halt there. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. And then you did have a couple good run-ins. Uh, you met uh, Rachel Ray uh, through the South Beach Food and Wine Festival, which brought you to kind of where you're at now in your career. Uh, and I, full disclosure, I have been listening to your podcast as well. Uh, and I haven't been enjoying it. Actually, I, I listened to Raffaella's boss, uh, Chef Keller, this morning on my run. Uh, so, oh, by the way, Cappy, I did shave today. Uh, there you for go. I shaved today in <laughs> honor of you coming on. And that's exactly what you said to Chef Thomas Keller. Think, so, yeah. 
you got to do it. Few man. People, there's very few people I shave for. One, my mother, if she really wants me to shave. Um, Chef Keller, being my CIA training, we had to be cleanly shaven uh, every morning at CIA. So for Chef Keller, and then uh, the first time I met Michelle Obama, um, I shaved that one time. But um, I thankfully, through the job I have, have met her quite a few times and um, didn't shave the, the following times. There you go. <laughs> you want me so to go into my Rachel story? Um, yeah, go into your Rachel story because I think a few of us know it or have heard kind of the okay. famous story now. But at the same time, uh, we got a nice spattering of students listening as well as industry, yeah. as well as, remember, this is going to be rebroadcasted. So love right. to hear it. And, and Raphael, you're on deck next. So just be prepared. Yeah, you're welcome to, you know, say speed it up, Kaplan. Yep. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, I was a student lead for the chef demos, and then I wound up getting a full-time uh, job opportunity um, after I graduated FIU. So I, I was one of the first full-time employees for the South Beach Wine and Food Festival. So I was an employee of FIU, but I was based at Southern, Southern Wine and Spirits was the name at the time, um, their office, Southern Glazer now. Um, so I was in charge of with a couple other many a couple other many people um producing the the culinary demonstrations i had a team of 75 people or so that helped make it happen um and this is in the early days and, and people like emerald and tyler florence and giada de Laurentiis and rachel ray were there but these people didn't have managers and publicists and agents and assistants so we would talk directly to them well at the time i got a call on our walkie talkie our radio that said hey rachel ray needs a a ride from the Lowe's, the host hotel, the hospitality suite down to the beach. And we had a golf cart um, transportation system. Um, and so I, at the time, I made uh, fun food t-shirts um, as a hobby, which I still make. And I would wear different t-shirts with different foods on them. And that day I happened to be wearing a t-shirt that was yellow and it said polenta on it in brown. And so I went to pick up Rachel at the Lowe's Hospitality Suite on the fourth floor in one of the rooms. And, and I walk in, and I said, hi, Rachel. And she said, oh, hey, cool shirt. Where'd you get that? And I was like, oh, I made it. And she's like, what do you mean you made it? I was like, oh, it's just a hobby. I, I, I make it for fun. Um, and she's like, OK, cool. I have a couple friends, one I call Spud and one I call Potato. Can you make me some? And I was like, yeah, sure, absolutely. And she's like, OK, cool. And then as we're walking down, you know, through the Lowe's Hotel, back to the golf carts, you know, behind the swimming pool. She's like, I don't get it. You make these? I was like, yeah, it's just a hobby. You know, back back home in Chicago, I, you know, press them on the shirt and whatever. She goes, okay, cool. Well, if I give you like 10K or 50K, can we start a t-shirt business together? And I was like, sure. Uh, you know, I was like in my young 20s at the time. And I was like, what the heck just happened to me? Um, so I took her down the beach and we exchanged information and she kept in touch with me nearly every week. This was just as she was starting her um, magazine, which she has a national magazine, this was just uh, a year or so before she um, launched her daytime show under uh, the Harpo Oprah umbrella. So we kept in touch. We started selling T-shirts. She wore one of the T-shirts I made for her on the inaugural cover of her magazine um, in 2005. And this is as I was looking um, to not change careers, but looking for the next chapter in my career, if you will. And she's like, why don't you come out to New York and, and we'll figure something out to do together. So um, in my free time while working for the festival, I taught cooking classes for kids at a, a local store that was in Coral Gables at the time. It was called Ars Majerica. Um, so I did that on the weekends and I wound up moving to New York. I worked uh, with Rachel when she launched her daytime television show uh, and I helped her start and I still run her cooking and kids charity, which is called the Yummo Organization. Uh, and... That was my path to, to Rachel. I, I couldn't have planned it. I still can't plan it, which is why if you ask me the question, where do you hope to be five years from now, I could give you an answer every single year since I was at FIU, and it would never be, you know, correct. <laughs> it's a good thing you uh, a you were driving the right golf cart at yeah. the right time, wasn't it? Now timing now, is everything. Yeah. Now, Raffaella, I'd love to hear Cappy. That was great, man. Uh, love to hear a little bit about your story. Now, as I quickly hinted to, uh, my beautiful wife and I were doing a mini moon. Our honeymoon and official wedding was postponed, canceled, but we had a little mini moon. And one of the treats was to go dine and experience uh, the French Laundry. I've never been per se and stuff like that. And the first person that greeted me and saw my FIU pin was Raffaella. Uh, 
Uh, we hit it off. We had an amazing experience. And the more I kind of dug into her background and all these amazing restaurants she's worked in, um, that's the part of that story. She has two degrees, including a master's degree from the Chaplin School. We're incredibly proud of you of that one. But let's hear your story. Oh, and also, uh, are you running marathons or are you just doing uh, cross training? Uh, I'm doing cycling now. So. Oh, all right, all right. Well, I, again, you know, I was out running this morning, thinking of all you guys, and, and say, listening to Cappy's podcast, thinking of your boss. So let's hear your story and what brought you to basically the pinnacle of the fine dining industry, in many of our opinions. And I see Chef Massey smiling, so let's go. Yeah. So I uh, went to FIU. I grew up in Miami, um, and kind of was that person that changed what they wanted to study every other month. And I ran into a friend from high school, like in the hallways. And she's like, yeah, I'm on my way to go taste tequila today. And I was like, what? I'm like, you're taste like taking a class and you're tasting tequila. And I was like, what class is this? What's this degree? And kind of just fell into it that way. Um, and, you know, really loved it. I got the band fee scholarship in my undergrad, which Rocco uh, bought my ticket to Europe for. I remember I was sitting in his office one afternoon and we booked a ticket for two months to Europe um, and kind of just went from there and really kind of just like followed the path of really notable chefs that were coming to Miami. Uh, I met a lot of incredible people along the way. I opened the one in South Beach and worked with Tom Colicchio. Um, I opened Bazaar Mar in Brickell and worked with Jose Andres and just have a huge, you know, passion and love for food. Um, and then the surf club was opening up in uh, Surfside, Florida, and kind of knew the chef that was opening and the GM and went into that uh, a year and a half later, uh, the director of operations for the East Coast approaches me and says they're looking to hire somebody in California in Yonville. And you kind of think about it for a second and you turn around and you say yes. And you pack your entire house in a pod and you drive cross country with your dog and your mom. And so here I am. Yeah, it's been pretty crazy. Got here in, it's gonna be a year. I got here on December 31st, drove over the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, found out my pod was gonna be a week late and started with the team in January. Um, so started with them, we closed in March because uh, of quarantine and everything. So it's been a pretty uh, intense 2020, I would say. Um, but it was so nice to see an FIU pin, like one of the days that we're there. And I'm just yeah. like, family. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I and mean, we're incredibly proud to have you. And then I see uh, Do John, Dr. John Bushman just said uh, one of his favorite students. So John, you can wave. There you go. Perfect on that one. Well, I worked with John at the festivals. I was on his logistics team driving the golf carts. Uh, That's it. John John does an amazing job with food rescue. So we always give praise where praise is due. And he's just our, one of our great rock stars. So Dr. Bushman, as always, thank you for that, what you do. So Ray, brother, where's my boy Ray be popping up here in a minute? Now, full disclosure, I've known Ray now for over 10 years. Uh, Ray is from uh, Compton outside of LA. And I remember when he first told me that when I first met him. Ray, I'm not gonna say the year, man, but uh, he was in one of my first wine classes I was teaching and look at you now, my friend. Ray is a certified sommelier as well as one of the buyers for Kerasam. He also has a very successful uh, side hustle, as I like to say, called the Royal Vines. Uh, so Ray, let's hear a little bit about your story and also a little bit about your wine journey. Yeah, so uh, my journey honestly really starts with you, sir. Um, I was, Started in Compton, California is where I'm from. I uh, went to school in Long Beach, California, and you know, decided I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I loved cooking at the time. So I was like, you know what? Looks like I'm gonna be going across country, head to Miami, go to Johnson & Wells and do the culinary thing, maybe be a great chef. And then I started working in kitchens and decided this is too tight for me. Uh, I'm too much of a social butterfly. So I had to get back out into the front of the house uh, so I transitioned my studies to more food service management, got a bachelor's uh, with Johnson & Wells. Um, and my last class, one of my last classes, I feel like was yours uh, in that wine class. And, you know, of course, we go through cocktails. And at the time, I was bartending for a while. So 
you know, cocktails came very easy, spirits came very easy. And then the wine came and everyone's like, oh, you know, I smell kiwi and gooseberries. And I'm thinking to myself, what in the world is everyone talking about? It smells like wine. Uh, and uh, I passed that class by the skin of my teeth, I feel like, but uh, I passed. And, you know, I, I remember coming back to you and saying, you know, I really could have pushed myself a little bit more and I really want to learn more. I want to be a Psalm. And you gave me a stack of books. You said, read this. I read through all of them. And I believe I started, uh, <laughs> I read so much that, you know, the next time I went in for an interview at a fine dining establishment, you know, I was a shoe and, you know, the manager said, hey, what's your wine knowledge on the scale from one to 10? And I said, three, he looks at me funny. And I'm like, you know, even being a master's only, hey, you, you could never be a 10. There's no way you can know everything about wine because it's always changing. So I ended up working for Seasons 52 and working really closely as a corporate trainer uh, shortly after working with them. Uh, opened up two locations in Houston, worked there for a little bit, helped them out, um, learned everything I could and transitioned through their entire program as far as you know, management was concerned. And then decided that, you know what, it was time to come back to Miami. Uh, we opened up No Name Chinese, which the service there was absolutely impeccable um, for the short time that I was there. And then I was uh, pretty much recruited and stolen away from the industry um, by my uh, current boss and started working for Kerasam. So for those that don't know, Kerasam is actually a supplier slash distributor slash import exporter, if you will. Um, and we supply the cruise industry as well as the Caribbean markets uh, as well as far as export is concerned. So we'll if you're on a cruise ship ever anywhere in the world, chances are what you're drinking came out of uh, our warehouse. Um, so that's what I do now. Royal Vines is something that I do on the side, um, which is, you know, started out as a hobby, just private wine tastings, cocktail classes, mixology classes, whatever you want to call them. Um, and, you know, now doing YouTube and, you know, doing something called the Black Owned Wine Review, where I'm perpetuating and promoting uh, beautiful, outstanding wines that deserve a lot more credit um, that we have here in the States and internationally, so. Yeah, good stuff. And I, and I do like, and I do check out your show every once in a while. I go, that a boy, Ray. And of course you work with Isabel Henry, uh, FIU alumni and good friend of mine. Yes. It's amazing how these little dots happen, don't they, Ray, huh? So uh, good to see you, brother. Good to see you. So I love all of your stories, you know, and we've had an incredible year here in 2020. I know I've been joking around this week saying the dumpster fire of a year, but hey, we're almost there. We're, we've almost made it. So uh, love to hear a little bit about, and you know, Ray, I got you on my screen now in front of me here. Let's talk a little bit about the cruise industry. You know, I know you had to shut down a little bit um, and you don't have a crystal ball, but uh, what are you seeing right now with the cruise industry? You know, I see the cruise industry coming back really strong. Um, it's just a matter of time at this point. You know, there's still people that are cruising uh, in the world, obviously not out of the United States, um, but, you know, uh, there was about 280 passenger crews leaving China for the first time uh, since, what, January last year? Um, so there's still cruising that's going on in the world, definitely not at the scale it was before. Um, but my guess would be springtime, late winter, early spring, maybe even late spring, um, you're going to see a big boom as far as the cruise industry being back and people wanting to cruise. I mean, they're already talking about people are, uh, there's a huge surge in sales right now for 2022 because you know, people were just like, man, we got to get out of here. We got to travel. We got to do this. And you have a lot of people that are their cruise people and that's what they do every year. And they're missing out on, on their vacations and, and their, uh, their fun time. So um, we're going to, I think that we're going to see a lot more people cruising. I think that, uh, I think people are just ready to get back out there. Yeah, and I think we're going to see also a, a safer experience as well, you know, and that's one yeah, of the big uh, concerns. Absolutely, no. Safer is crazy what they're doing. The technology that they're bringing in on the cruise lines as far as um, trying to mitigate any type of uh, illnesses or viruses is ridiculous. I mean, there's 
so many different things that they're doing. Uh, I believe it's uh, MSC that is doing something called the medallion. And mm -hmm. basically it's like, you don't need to touch anything. Everything is like, you know, this medallion pays for what you need. It has your credit card information already uploaded on it beforehand, you know, and they're sending, they send these medallions to you at home. And I mean, they're coming out the woodworks with all types of different technology to try and make sure they keep people safe. So that innovation side is absolutely amazing. So, you know, Raffaella on when I had the opportunity to dine with you in October, you know, it felt like a, for lack of better terms, a traditional fine dining experience. There wasn't a flaw in service and everything else. But then when we, and we were dining outside with social distancing. And when we walked downstairs and you were nice enough to give us a tour of the kitchen, I almost said galley, right? Um, you know, wearing our mask. And we looked over to the dining room to our left and it was empty. Um, how has the Thomas Keller group and particularly you and your team survived during these challenging times? We just have to have been really adaptable and flexible to everything that's being thrown at us this year. Um, so we opened back up in July and it was outdoors only. And we're really fortunate to have all the space that we have, but just making it work with outdoors. You know, we kind of installed these little like cement pads to accommodate more tables. Um, you know, we were in the thick of summer and hitting temperatures of 105 and having to move certain reservations just because it was too hot at the time that we were opening. Um, you know, getting portable fans for guests because, you know, there's no AC outside. Um, then we had the fires. Then we opened back up a certain percentage inside and then we were able to accommodate inside a little bit. Uh, and then it came the rain. So, you know, we've just been really working with everything that's been thrown at us. Uh, the team is amazing and they're super hands on and have the passion to be there. So whatever that has to be done, they're willing to do it, which is really, really great. Um, now we're kind of working with the sun a little bit. So we've moved our hours up. Uh, so we are starting to serve lunch at 1230, uh, just because it gets too cold at night. Um, but it's definitely been an adjustment. We're not um, at all inside anymore, which uh, makes it a little more difficult, but we're making it work. And, you know, it's, it's really the demand is there. The guests are super excited to be there. It's a different experience for them to be able to eat in our courtyard and our garden. Uh, we have an amazing team of landscapers that really pay attention to every little leaf and flower and tree that now you're so immersed in it, you appreciate it so much more. So it's nice that their work is really getting looked at as well. And then as where you sat, you know, it was on the balcony or overlooking our garden, which when can you ever say you're having dinner, you know, while looking at this gorgeous garden that's basically on your plate. Yeah, you know, and and you made my wife very, very happy that day. So that was good. Happy wife is happy life, as we all know. So it's good. And, uh, you know, you're saying, you know, we have gardeners and I'm, all I'm saying in my head is, of course you do. You're Thomas Keller's group. Of course you do. Nothing better. So good. Hey, you know, Cappy, um, you're wearing two hats here. And I do like that hat that says her. And I think Chef Massey and I need one of those. Uh, yeah, I like that. Um, but you're wearing two roles here. So first, you know, let's talk a little bit about the culinary scene. You know, I know Chicago's having a real tough go where you live, but I also really want to also hear a little bit about your fantastic, and I'll be very candid podcast because I listen to a whole lot of them lately. You get some great guests. Uh, John, we got to work on that. Cappy's got some serious gets here. Uh, you know, you got a couple of my, you got Eric Ropair, Thomas Keller. I mean, really good stuff. But let's hear first hear about what are you seeing in the culinary world? If you want to talk about Chicago and New York, go for it. Yeah. Listen, I got to be honest, I owe my network to FIU, you know, FIU and CIA with, with the guests I get on the podcast. A lot of people come to me and they go, oh, you, you could get anyone. You work with Rachel Ray. I'm like, I, I knew many of these people before Rachel Ray working for the South Beach Wine and Food Festival, networking with these, you know, chefs and different talent that came through here. Um, so I, I need to tell the story. Sorry. I recently interviewed on the podcast uh, Michael Simon. And I asked him one of the most memorable meals he's ever had. And Raphael, you'll appreciate this. He, he said his most memorable meal was a three-day honeymoon um, that him and his wife took when they got married a long time ago. And they went to Yountville. And he had done some cooking with um, Chef Keller because they were featured in one of Michael Ruhlman's books. 
Um, by the way, if anyone on here is like not too familiar with Thomas Keller, French Laundry, like, shame on, on you. Go shame. On Amazon, <laughs> go on Amazon now and get, I mean, he has a new book, French Laundry per se, but get that French Laundry cookbook. I mean, it is on nearly a hundred percent of chef's shelves yeah, that I see. It's, it's, in, my um, it's, in, it's in my kitchen. Yeah. It's yeah. incredible. I mean, I, I read that thing like it's a book. Um, so Michael Simon said this was his most memorable meal. He goes, my wife, Liz and I, you know, ate there and chef Keller came out to the table and said, do you mind if I cook for you? And they said, of course. Um, so he said we had 36 courses. Each of them received different items. Everything was two bites each. And so he says, now when someone says, oh, Chef Keller's overrated, I say, oh, really? You make 72 different dishes that all taste amazing, you know, for one, for one night of dining. Um, anyway, the, 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 the things you guys uh, do with Thomas Keller Group are incredible. Um, culinary scene in general, I mean, I could start in a hundred different places. I could talk about culinary. I could talk about media. Just diving in, cul culinarily speaking, it's tough. I mean, there's huge news with like DoorDash, you know, going yeah. public yesterday, as you saw. And there's a ton of the, I mean, the, the tech, the food and tech apps, they're kind of like a necessary evil for these restaurants. They have, they have to do them because they get to sell more product, but there's fees and I can't speak too much. They all have a different model. Um, I think there's a couple different kinds of restaurant tours out there. There's ones that the pandemic happened and and people sat back and said, what the heck are we going to do and did nothing, you know, and the restaurant may be closed now or isn't going to make it. And then there's people who said, let's go, what, you know, we got to do something. What are we going to do? Um, let's open, you know, a, a second restaurant within our kitchen. That's only virtual. Let's do takeout boxes. We're a Michelin star restaurant. Who cares? Let's give people this experience. Grant Ackett's and Alinea in Chicago. I mean, granted, Grant Ackett's is a uh, business partner, Nick Kokonis. They own Talk, the, the platform Talk, which is mm -hmm. kind of like a, a reservation type system. They pivoted their whole system to be for, for to go. And they had thousands of restaurants using Talk. You go on there and you, you know, you pay for the, the item and, and it's, it's pickup. But Alinea restaurant, three Michelin star restaurant, top 10 in the world at one point. They had they were doing seven hundred orders a night at one point. I think they did thirteen hundred orders on Mother's Day. Like this is crazy. Granted, it wasn't four hundred dollars a person. It was more more affordable meals, but still not cheap. Um, so I don't know. You know, I've, I there's a chef here, Lee Wolin. He has Boca Restaurant. He he was about to open a rotisserie chicken concept in a food hall at the end of March. Obviously, that didn't happen. Eventually, he wound up opening that rotisserie chicken concept out of his Michelin-starred restaurant, Boca. He started doing kits. He just did a Hanukkah kit for people. He just did a Thanksgiving kit for people. Like, he's not stopping. You know, you Love have that. to be... Love it, yeah. Him. Eventually, he could go back to what that fine dining michelin star restaurant is. But he's been able to... The chefs aren't like making a ton of money right now but they're what they want i think is to stay afloat and be able to keep staff employed um it, the, the ones that they can now i I'm, I'm not too tied into the fast food world i think fast food's doing plenty well they're set up for mass and the drive-through obviously works great in a time like this so um i don't know that's my two cents i talk to chefs all over and it's scary. It's a scary time. Restaurants aren't going to go away and DoorDash and Uber Eats and all these aren't going to take over the world. Um, and it will just be like a, a harvest, if you will. A, re a lot of restaurants, unfortunately, are going to go away, but eventually there's still going to be money there for new restaurants to come along. So yeah. you're going to see new chefs or chefs that had to close a restaurant, but coming up with a new concept. So. Yeah. And we've seen it. And I've, I've said this many times on different shows and podcasts and, you know, we're seeing an amazing amount of innovation and creativity in our industry. And it's almost, you know, we're, we're made of a bunch of hustlers. I still consider myself a hustler. We're out there working, we're doing it. Um, but the strong will survive. Um, that, that is a fact. And the, the ones that are adapting before they have to 
are doing even better. I mean, Raphael, your case in point there, and what a great little segue I just did. You see what I did there, Cappy? That was a nice segue, wasn't it? <laughs> um, but, you know, when we're talking a little bit about leadership, you know, every time I have a dynamic group or dynamic guest like any of you, I have to talk about leadership on Bacardi Talks, is we are all about developing future hospitality leaders. Um, and, you know, Raphael, you know, in your role, and you can feel free to talk about outside of the French Laundry, uh, I saw you in action and everything else, but, you know, if you were a uh, a student right now, uh, you know, and you have two degrees from us, what would be those words of advice and what leadership styles work for you? Like when you say, you know, hey, I, this didn't work for me, but now I've adapted and this works better for me. And then Ray, we're going to kind of go in your direction about some multi-unit, but uh, Raphael, let's start a little bit about on leadership that works for you. For me, it's really about kind of bringing it back to what you learned in kindergarten. You know, those little rules were treat people how you want to be treated, be kind to others, uh, just those kind of little things that you learn in the beginning of, you know, your stages of life, uh, I think really works for me with leadership. Um, you know, we're all working with adults. They all have different experiences, different backgrounds, different cultures. Um, and I really think it's important of, you know, not exactly what you say, but how you say things to people. Um, especially now, you know, everyone kind of walking into the French laundry, everyone is extremely experienced, professional, uh, and they all want to be there. Uh, it's, so it's just really learning how to work with all these different people. Um, but for me, the biggest thing is respect. And then also, you know, showing that if you're going to ask someone to do something, you're also willing to do it. You know, I, nothing will ever be below me, whether it's, you know, clearing a table, marking a table, whatever it might be. It's, you know, it's all kind of, we're all there together. I have your back, you have my back. Um, you, you felt it. You really did feel it when you were, you know, on the floor there and I was watching you. Uh, you definitely felt it on that one. You know, Ray, you know, I remember when you decided to take the job with Darden. I remember you came in and talked to me about it. And I said, Ray, go. I said, they have amazing systems. Remember that conversation? I said, learn mm, the yes. systems. And then you became yes. a trainer for them. Um, so big picture. And I, and I haven't changed my mind on that at all. Darden is still a fantastic restaurant group with amazing systems. Uh, but Great. now... What about your leadership style? And, you know, I've seen you in action. You invited me to restaurant openings and I've been checking you out for years, but like, what about your leadership style and what's changed? So I think one thing that has changed for me uh, from being a young manager to now is I definitely have, I've tried my different hats on as far as leadership roles are concerned. And, you know, what works for me is servant leadership. Like I'm, at the end of the day, what we all do is service, you know, whether we're being of service to a guest, being of service to, you know, our internal guests or our, our, uh, our staff, we're always of service to someone. So for me, it's always about, it's always about the service. How can I help? Um, and at the end of the day, when you're talking about what we do as far as um, developing people, you're still yet again, being of service to someone. You know, no matter what the conversation may, may be, it could be a hard conversation, but you know what, you're serving them, you know, the, the, the best that you can. So um, I have to say this really quickly, if I may, you know, when I took on, you know, the, the last restaurant that I did, No Name Chinese, when I took that on, this was amazing staff and the staff. The staff was amazing, I think, because of my selection and how I view service. Um, I had a little trick that I used every interview. And anyone, please feel free to take this away and, and use it in, in your perspectives, uh, perspective locations. But every interview, I would make sure that we went to a table that had the chairs up because we would keep our chairs up. And I'd take the chairs down and tell them to have a seat wherever they like go and get them some water. And then we do the interview, blah, 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 which there were some important things there, but the most important thing was how we ended it. And it was, I got up, said, thank you, shook their hand. And if they started putting the chair up, they were a shoe in for me because that's what I call service. You know, and I, I was like, you know what? You're service hearted. I don't care about what your experience was. I don't care if you worked at McDonald's, you're gonna come and you're gonna, you're gonna work here and I'm gonna show you something. 
And it got to a point where my team, they ran the restaurant for me. You know, they, they, the culture, the feeling, they loved being there. We worked hard, but they loved being there. So, and I think that's one of the most important things, you know, especially in a restaurant setting, because it can be hard. It can be <laughs> grueling. The hours can be long. You're working holidays, so on and so forth. So it's important that you care about the people you're working with and you care for the place and you have a sense of ownership in the place that you have. So I've, I've shifted a little bit, but kind of got off on a little bit of a tangent. But to me, that proved that that type of leadership style uh, works best, especially for me. Sure. Yeah, and I think there's a, I think there's a, a few chapters of a book in the future for you there, buddy. That was right on point. <laughs> it made me so happy. And I know my mom's on here too. So Professor Mary Connors, I know you're smiling right now on Ray as well. That's amazing though. So uh, good stuff there, brother. So Cappy, you yeah. know, particularly in your role as vice president of culinary, uh, you wear many, many hats. Uh, you have to deal with many, many personalities. You deal with a lot of celebrities. You deal with a lot of that stuff going on. But what are some of your, and you know, this is going towards Cappy here, um, tricks of the trade. What's some of your best overall leadership advice that's worked well for you, again, as our senior statesman on this panel? Um, you know, I, I, I think my, I come at this from a different uh, perspective because to be, to be honest, and this is shocking to people, the team at Rachel Ray headquarters is like less than 10. Like we don't have many people. We have a daytime television show that has a hundred staff members. We have a magazine that has, you know, 50 plus staff members. We have her Food Network shows, which has a whole crew. We have a lot of arms of our businesses that have big teams, but our internal team is very small. So I don't have this whole team that I'm leading but whenever I have to lead, if I'm going to produce an event for Rachel, for example, we do a huge event we've been doing every year at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. Sure. And we put out over 15,000 portions of food like in a matter of a few days. So there's many teams down there from an event production side, from a kitchen side, from a front of house hospitality side that I have to have my eye on. Where are the garbage cans? What are they wearing? You know, How are they serving? What are we serving on? all you know a hundred of these little details that we all have to think about in our respective you know property or business or industry um so but there's sometimes where i have to go down to help uh, her daytime show on a re at a remote location where they're shooting and i have to you know we're, we're doing thousands of portions of food and i'm in there like shopping onions you know sometimes there's a team of 50 people that they're asking me is this okay is that okay and sometimes i'm actually you know in there so I, I, I come at this at a different perspective. I wasn't like a manager of a restaurant leading a team, you know, type thing, but it's I'll still you, all I, leadership, brother. It is, it's still it all leadership. Yeah. In my training, you know, at FIU and through the festival, a lot of the times the Rachel's daytime television show, by the way, her daytime television show launched in 2006. Since it's been launched, there's been over 35 other daytime television shows that have been started and canceled already. Wow. She's still on the air. So, the, these people on, on daytime syndicated TV, so the daytime show, if they were doing a remote shoot, meaning not in the studio in a different city, a special, you know, whole hour show at a different location. I was one of the first people that they would call to be involved in that because of my event experience. It was because yeah. they were essentially doing an event with cameras and, and whatnot, so. Absolutely, um, you know, and it goes to show that, you know, a lot of, and Raphael, I remember you even saying about South Beach Food and Wine Festival uh, and how that kind of impacted your career choices as well. So that's that's amazing. So, uh, so as I said earlier um, on our show today, or shall we say our session today, but leading to uh, the Two Bar Stools and a Knife uh, rebroadcast of this show tomorrow, I got to invite my good friend and colleague, Chef John Noble Massey. John, uh, you are such a class act. I'm going to give you Comte Blanche and uh, whatever oh. direction, any direction you want to go in, my friend, feel free to go. Well, fabulous well, turtleneck, that, by the way. The fabulous fabulous turtleneck. I don't know what I could add. Um, well, one of the questions, and thank you. It's been amazing to hear all of these awesome stories from each of you. And you are such a wonderful representation of the next generation. So that gives us all huge uh, confidence that industry is in good hands. Uh, one of the questions that many of the students ask me, I, I teach both culinary and some restaurant management classes at school, is, you know, 
chef, why are, why are we taking some culinary classes? We aren't going to be chefs. And not, uh, the three of you uh, have not pursued a, a chef career, and you've all been successful in your own rights. But I'd love to hear each of your perspectives on the value of being in the kitchen and how that translates to what you're doing now, the value that that culinary education brings, whether it was the two-year program that, that Cappy took or or Raphael, the classes that you took, or, or, or Ray, the, you know, the time that you spent at JWU. Perfect. Yeah. Ray, you want to take that one off the take? So we got to yeah. show these uh, CIA guys a thing or two there, Ray. So let's hear it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll definitely take it. Absolutely. Um, no, it's extremely important uh, to have that experience. Anytime I've been in a restaurant, I need, as a manager, as a leader, I need to be able to do any job that's in that building. Um, you never know what's gonna happen. Someone might have a family emergency and you might have to fill in, you know, um, anything can happen. But understanding the mechanics and understanding what goes into building a food menu, building a plate, um, the presentation, understanding all of those things makes you a more well-rounded individual and manager and leader in that building. You know, because sometimes, you know, a chef might be in the corner doing something and he might not see, you know, who's plating, you know, this particular item and you notice that it's wrong or that they're doing it wrong. You should be able to go and correct that. You know, if, the, uh, if you have that kind of relationship with your chef, you should be able to correct that person and say, hey, you know what, we want to move this this way or we want to present it in this fashion. The other thing is numbers. You know, yeah, you, you're the front of the house guy, you're the GM, you're the director of operations, whatever the case might be. But the numbers, understanding the numbers and understanding how that correlates to the kitchen and how it overall correlates to the restaurant and the success of it is extremely important. And you need to have that food background. You need to have at least a little bit of experience to understand what's going on uh, in the heart of the house. So that way you can operate uh, a well-oiled machine. Yeah. In my opinion, I like that. And, and awesome. Chef Massey, uh, Ray, perfect. I'm going to add a little flavor here for Raffaella because I learned from Cappy's podcast this morning. Um, you guys really don't do the front of the house, the back of the house. You have the kitchen and the dining room, um, which I love. But yeah. let's hear let's hear your side of that. But also Chef Massey's question regarding kind of you have a little bit of a culinary culinary chutzpah. Let's hear a little bit about it. I do have a little. I worked. I opened Hakkasan at the Fountain Blue in the kitchen side. And kind of like Ray, I also felt a little too stuffy. Um, realized that when you do talk in the kitchen, you get in trouble for it. And I was like, I want to talk to people. So it wasn't a very um, long uh, kind of position just because I wanted to get out there and talk to guests. Um, but in regards to culinary, it's just, I think the more knowledge you have about the entire operation, uh, the better, you know, you're going to advance more and uh, we're super fortunate to be able to work with such amazing ingredients and purveyors that our menu changes every day. You have to know what sauces, the technique behind them. So it's really important for the team members to have, you know, copies of the books, always recommend a copy of a food lover's companion. If you don't know something, don't be embarrassed to ask, you know, it's really good to talk about techniques and how things are cooked a certain way. So just knowing that, you know, gives you more passion behind the food and you can talk about it better with guests, uh, especially guests that are dining with us that are really curious about where our butter comes from. And it's from this really small farm in Vermont who Diane St. Clair, she actually milks her butter, uh, her cows, sorry, twice a day herself. Um, and named one of her cows Keller because she had to buy more cows to make love it. I love it. By, per se. So that just great. stories and why certain products are super special to us um, is really important. Um, and then it makes you a better cook at home too. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I like uh, Chef Massey, Ray, and Cappy. You know, I have a culinary degree first. Uh, I always, first thing I say, John, is like, well, I'm, I'm a chef by trade. Everything else just kind of came along with it. Uh, and a lot of my background, I mean, I was a yacht chef and I still have that thing. I, I don't know what it is. I just still have that thing that mise en place is everything. Timing is everything. And uh, again, you know, Cappy, you got me all inspired this morning. Listen to your podcast with Chef Keller. <laughs> Uh, but uh, let's hear your response to uh, Chef John Noble Massey's question. 
Um, I will say um, there was something I was going to add there. Oh, service. Um, if anyone hasn't read, Danny Meyer has a fantastic. Uh, Setting the table, required reading into the chaplain school. Yeah. Um, if you like to hold an actual book, remember when we used to do that, I would read it. Um, otherwise, there's it's it's available audio and he reads it, which is, which is pretty fantastic. Um, I think the importance of being very well. Re- I, listen, I, I think. If you're just a chef and you know nothing about service, it's not great. If you're a GM or manager or server and you know nothing about food, also not great. Um, I also love to see a chef that used to be a pastry chef or a pastry chef that used to be a cook. Um, I was giving this example the other day to someone I was talking with on my podcast. When I at F, at FIU and CIA, if we were at or ever had a group project and there was a task that um, I needed to do and they would say hey break up into groups and someone do this this and this i would always pick the one that i wanted to do the least quite frankly because i knew i would learn the most so if i'm in culinary school and someone says saute station there braise there grill there if i already knew how to braise why should i go to braise again you know if i need help on my saute i'm going to go to saute so um, i kind of use that mentality in a way of um, being well-rounded. I, I helped open uh, Timo, which is right around mm-hmm. the corner from FIU in Sunny sure. Isles. Um, I worked with them over a month before they opened the doors. Um, that was one of my first uh, service jobs. But uh, Chef Tim Andriola, who's an FIU graduate, he knew that I went to CIA. So, you know, it was a blessing and a curse. The, the He would always pull me, you know, front of the house was, I, I loved being in, in service. See, now, Rafaela, ever since Chef Keller corrected me and not saying front of house and back of house, every time I say it, I, like, hear him in my head. Um, anyhow, <laughs> um, whenever I, if the, if the dining room was slammed or the kitchen was slammed, the chef would always, you know, pull me back into the kitchen. So I'm here wearing my service, clean service gear, but I'm, you know, helping them execute something in the kitchen, which is, is nice, is a nice thing to, to have also. And then um, in between my time at CIA and FIU, I worked at a restaurant as a Michelin starred restaurant in Chicago called Naha, and I worked in pastries. You know, I didn't go to school for baking and pastry. I went for culinary. We learned a little bit about baking and pastry, which, you know, gave us some of like the basic skills. But um, when I went to Naha, I worked in the pastry kitchen and it was great. And the chef, Carrie Nahabedian, who's incredible, she also used to be a pastry chef. chef so she kind of knew what she wanted. I don't think it's bad to not know it and bring on a pastry chef, for example, that knows what they're doing. But it's nice to know, you know to be well-rounded as we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's that's half the battle. And I've always, uh, a lot like your guys' stories, and I always saw the kind of the blurs out in the dining room, and I'm like, I'm more like that. Uh, I still love to cook, but I'm like, I'm more like that guy. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm being mindful of our time. Uh, again, for those of you that want to stick around for a little bit of Q&A when we wrap up the show after our video, not yet, Dale. Uh, but uh, I, as tradition goes, we started it with the first Bacardi Talks. We carried it on uh, with our successful podcast, Two Bar Stools and a Knife. Uh, we had the speed rail. Now, with the holidays approaching, uh, this is our opportunity. Now, I have customized each one of these questions for each of you uh, due to your backgrounds, uh, doing a little bit of your stories of each one. Uh, so, you know, Raffaella, we're going to start with you. And this is kind of, uh, again, Cappy, I- I'm stealing a little bit from you because I liked it. It's kind of your, your favorite. All right now, but it's going to be your favorite, but you're going to have to tell us why. So Raffaella, we were talking about guests, the guest experience, the amazing experience my wife and I had at the French Laundry. But Raffaella, what's your favorite guest story? Either you impact that guest, something that you always remember, some story you use during training and why? Oh man, that's a tough one. Um, I think it's really, you know, not judging a book by its cover. You know, you never know who you're gonna take care of. You never know who might be working where, who they might be representing and they could end up being your next boss. So I took care of a guest, it was a table of four. um, And, you know, just being my normal self, how I am with everyone, very chatty, you know, making sure I'm doing my job everywhere and, uh, just taking care of this table a lot. And, you know, at the end of the night, here's my card. If you need anything, I could tell they weren't from Miami, you know, it's something you can kind of like 
pick on really quickly. Um, but at the end, they did give me their card and they said, you know, if you're ever looking to leave the position you're in, here's my card. You know, we'd love to have you on, like send me an email, reach out, whatever. Um, and it ended up being one of our uh, former director of operations for uh, Thomas Keller Restaurant Group, which was pretty wild because we never, you know, it wasn't, no one was alerted that they were coming in. They were in town. Um, and at that point they were scoping out the surf club um, and, you know, just building really good relationships with everyone you work with, I think is really important. Um, you know, don't burn any bridges uh, because you never know if you're going to be working with them again, or you might be interviewing for them at some point. And that's one of those cases where you walk into the room and you're like, yep, I know this person. Oh, so yeah. uh, I think it's really, really important, uh, you know, and that I've always been, uh, you know, a big advocate of, you know, don't judge someone on what they're wearing or whoever they might be with or whatever the case might be. It's, you know, treat everyone as you would someone who's coming into your dining room, um, not your front of the house, because we don't have those in our homes. <laughs> I love that though. I, I was, when I was out my run this morning, I'm like, right on, yeah. But it's yeah. true, you, you never know who's in your dining room. You never know who's in front of you and all guests, um, if you look at it from that lens, you know, we make some lifelong relationships. Uh, hell, it helped me get into undergrad, you know what I mean? So correct mom, you know, remember the guy I met. So on that note, uh, Mr. Ray, so we got a little bit of rough, all those good stuff. We got a little bit here now. Uh, I think I know a little bit about your palate. Um, I remember in some of those training sessions with you doing the blind stuff with you. Um, what's your best wine story, Ray? Now it can be outside the restaurant world, but what's your mm -hmm. best wine story and why? That's a hard one. That's, that's a what Raffaella said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really difficult because there's some nights I can't remember. Maybe too much, no, I'm just kidding, no. <laughs> but, uh, uh, seriously, I would say the one that stands out to me the most, um, the one that stands out to me most, I'll do a social one, which is kind of fun. You know, I went to, I'm a volunteer every year for the, um, for Texom, which is the Texas um, kind of like, it's like a huge beverage conference, basically, basically. So just a huge collection of beverage professionals um, and wonderful conference. If you haven't been, I suggest you check it out. Texom, T-E-X-S-O-M. Anyways, so I get there and it's maybe my first or second year volunteering. And, you know, there's tons of winemakers there. There's tons of wines and there's just tons of people that to learn from. And that was a really big highlight for me and really started like pushing me to learn more and be better and, and really study my craft. But the fun part came in one night after volunteering for like, seven, I don't know, from seven in the morning to about nine o'clock at night, there's a winemaker party. I'm like, really? I'm like, they do those? I'm like, okay, great. So I walk into the room, into one of his villas, and I'm like, all right, great. This, there's so many people in there. It's a packed room. And I'm like, man, I'm like, there's only space in the bathroom. So I'm standing in the bathroom and the bathroom's huge. And I'm talking to a friend of mine. I was like, man, I was like, I didn't know it was going to be like this. I look over in the bathtub. It's full of ice, water, and bottles of wine. And I said, I just died and went to heaven. <laughs> so I'm, I'm picking up bottles and just kind of like looking at what's there. I mean, I, I would never open it because, you know, it's not my party. So I'm looking and I pick up this bottle of 1999 Riesling from the Rheinhessen. And I'm like, yo, this is going to be delicious when they open it. And the wine, and the, this guy comes in, he's like, hey, are you going to open it? I was like, it's not my wine. I'm not going to, no, I don't. He said, no, 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 it's my wine. I made it open it and I'm like okay so I'm drinking 1990 Riesling or 1999 Riesling out of a paper cup from a hotel and it was the best one I had I was like this is absolutely amazing it was just it was amazing so then he tops it and I think he was showing off he tops it he said hey reach in and grab that bottle that's the 1990 I said what 1990 right behind the 1999 and they were both absolutely amazing and they aged gracefully they were beautiful and loved them so that's probably one of one of my cooler stories and wine. even out of a paper cup you know in some random hotel room yeah. it's, and again the magic of hospitality you never know what's going to happen on that one 
So, you know, Cap Cappy, we're coming your way now. Um, and John Massey and I know this question well, because we typically do this style question for culinary types like yourself. Uh, and we borrow it. Uh, John, you know where I'm going this. Uh, we borrow this from the CBS uh, Saturday morning uh, broadcast. Uh, we've asked quite a few people this one, but uh, any meal with any person, oh. any meal with any person, what is that meal and who is that person? And remember that person does not need to be with us anymore, but what would be that meal and who would be that person you want to cook for? Mr. Cap. So hard. I know. <laughs> and I feel like I ask these types of questions and I should be able to answer the type of question that I ask. It's tough because I, I'm extremely fortunate in my line of work. I've sat in meetings with president, former presidents, athletes, celebrities, and to me, these people are a human. I, I'm not. I don't know a lot of celebrities, believe it or not. So, I would walk past probably half of these people on the street. So, to me, they're just another person. And when I'm interacting with them, it's trying to find like a commonality because they get treated like a celebrity so much. Um, so there's been plenty that come across like Rachel's show where I just, oh, you're from Chicago, same. And then you kind of break that barrier, um, which is something that I used in interviews when I was at FIU. And it's something that I use today when I interview people trying to find something that you both like. But um, Again, I've, I've, I've. You're stalling, I've, Cappy. You're I stalling. know. <laughs> I, I've, I've talked with Tom. I, be, if I didn't have the podcast, I would have said someone like Chef Jacques Pepin, mm -hmm. or I would have said Thomas Keller. Yeah. Um, you know, from the culinary world, not from the culinary world. Um, I think Jay Z is an extremely fascinating okay person. Um, as a businessman and an entertainer, I think he's extremely fascinating. Um. But I, I mean, I've sat around a table with five people and one of those people is President Clinton, like in a meeting. Like, that's crazy, you know? Like I've been to, I've sat at the White House at a dinner with Michelle Obama. Like, that's crazy. So. And pretty cool at the same time. Yeah, I mean, yeah not yeah. to like drop names, but. Well, no, uh, my, I have steel-toed shoes on right now, so don't worry about it, I'll be fine. <laughs> Good. <laughs> But that, you know, I it's I, I'm I'm extremely fortunate in my line of work, and I am, I didn't even talked about the you know charity work that we've really done, um, which is how a lot of this has come about. We've worked with the Clinton Foundation, and when Michelle Obama had her Let's Move or you know organization and project. So I don't know. Horrible answer. Long. There you go. Ah, it's all good. All good. You know, <laughs> all that sets me up for it, brother. And I'm gonna be very mindful of our time. Is that we might have to have a part two with you guys. This has been a lot of fun. Really, really insightful stuff. So, Cappy, you're on my screen. A couple words of advice for graduating students. Go. Uh, network. Always get a card. Always follow up. Never not follow up. If you know you don't want to work for the Thomas Keller Group, don't. Doesn't matter find Raffaella's email after this and email her and say, thank you. That was inspiring because you never know when your career may change and when you may need to reach out to Raffaella. Absolutely. Absolutely. Raffaella, no hot spot for you. What are those words of advice for graduating students? Oh, be kind to others. Um, definitely network as well as what Kathy said. Um, and give it a shot. You know, it doesn't hurt to reach out to someone, e email someone. The worst answer you're going to get is no. Perfect, perfect. My main man, Ray, brother, what do you got? Words of advice. Listen, I agree with everything that these wonderful people have said, but I would have to say, shoot your shot. Shoot your shot. Like, like Rafael said, the worst case scenario, someone will tell you no, but you end up in the same position. And don't be afraid to start something. You know, I used to be this perfectionist where like, it's gotta be perfect before I start. You will never get to the finish line until you actually start the race. You cannot finish if you don't get out the blocks. Love it, love it. You guys have been an amazing, I've taken a little bit more time than realizing. Dale Gomez, let's get ready to queue up that video. Uh, for those of you gonna stick around for our quick Q&A session at the end, please feel free to stay on. We will not be recording that. Uh, feel free to stay on after the closing video. But on that note to our whole panel, thank you guys very, very much. From the half of the FIU Chaplain School, everyone, happy holidays. Be safe. Do things smart. And, hope, and I'm serious, gang. We might have to do a part two. This has been out.
Stand. Let's do it. I love it, guys. Thank you so much. That's Thank your you. cue. Gomez, hit it. Turn the recording off there.